Okay, so um, our next speaker is going to be talking to us about research data management. This is a topic that's particularly close to my heart because we're currently working on a policy for this at the university. Uh, that's a document that if you haven't read it or no one's talked to you about it, they will be doing so very soon. If you have any questions about this attempt, uh, please speak to, to me or Simon. Um, so I'll be taking lots of notes through this session. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Kevin Ashley, who's here from the Digital Creation Centre. Thank you, Kevin. So, before I can I just, I want to get a sense of, of who I'm talking to and what I might need to explain and whatnot. How many of you here would characterise yourself as providing some sort of service function, and, you know, either in IT or the library or in research services or something like that? Okay, a good number. Uh, how many are researchers? Oh, right, and, uh, another good split. And uh, who, who doesn't put themselves into either of those <laughs> categories? Okay, what, well, in, okay, funders. <laughs> Uh, indeed, and, and the gentleman at the back who, who didn't. Uh, non enthusiastic role creators. Right, okay, yeah. Well, just, I'll, not quite sure. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see how, how, how this comes across for, for, for you then. Okay, so I was asked to talk about research data management and, and, and open uh, access, but actually, I'm, I'm not going to say a lot about management, and partly I'll, I'm not sure that phrase. Research data management is, is rather leaden. Uh, it, it takes a lot of the interest out of this. And I, I could explain more. If you want to know more about why I'm not happy with that phrase, speak to me uh, afterwards. So it's really just about the issues of research data uh, and open and access. And I, and I begin by pointing to the Digital Curation Centre. You know, we have one of these strap lines. It's an obligatory thing, really, for any organisation, isn't it? Because good research needs good, needs good data. And there's a point at which I feel I could just stop there and say any questions, because I think that's enough of a justification, really, for why we should be looking toward, towards open data. But I, I guess I ought to do a little bit more to explain why that statement alone requires us to think quite hard about open access to data, and also when that becomes difficult and how we, we, we might need to, to deal with that. So it's worth reflecting on, on who might be interested uh, in, in these issues. Looking at HESA data from, from a couple of years ago, and this is when we were at the DCC, we were trying to work out who we needed to be speaking to ab about issues around research data. Of the 164 or so higher education institutions we could identify, about 43% get more than 5% of their income from, from research. They're all rough and ready playing around with, with Excel. Um, about 70% of them get more than a million a year from research. It may not always be a high percentage of their budget, but that's enough of a figure for it to become interesting to somebody. That's a, a significant sum uh, of money. So a good many universities should care about things that might affect that income. Uh, and you might say the others don't, don't <coughs> worry at all, but, but actually there's 4.4 billion one way or another going to universities with research grants. You may notice that's a different figure uh, from the one we heard about before about what's coming out of Grants UK. That's because not all of the Research Council money goes to universities. Some of it goes to institutions that Research Councils run themselves. That's a significant amount uh, of money that comes from all of us in the end as, uh, as taxpayers. And we should have an interest in ensuring <coughs> not only that it's producing the sort of research we want, but that it's working, being used most efficiently and that we're getting the most out of it. But those who are receiving that funding are beginning to get a bit nervous. As we've heard about, you know, those funders are beginning to get they're making more and more demands on us all the time. It's not just about the open access to publications, which we've heard a great deal about, but about data. So RCUK have issued these common principles on data policies a couple of years ago now, uh, I think. And those common principles are being translated into particular statements by each of the research councils in ways that they feel reflects um, practice in, in the particular disciplines uh, they're responsible for. And without going into the detail of what's there, these basic phrases that the research is a public good, uh, that we want to see the data that comes out of research preserved, that it should be discoverable, that yes, sometimes we need to deal with issues of confidentiality uh, and, and, and first use, uh, but that recognition of the reuse of data is as important as recognition uh, that, that, that we give when we cite uh, somebody else's publication, and that we should think of data as, as being a scholarly output. Uh, of, of equal value uh, in many cases and reiterating that issue about making the best use of public funding and recognising that often a research project will produce data that potentially is useful not just to that one piece of research and if we can get more value out of it we should, we should aim to do that. 
Those demands are translated in different ways. I mean, NERC in particular uh, has particular requirements about what they call data management plans. They're not the only research council to do that. That puts obligations on researchers, on PIs, to make statements about what they're going to do with their data, what they expect to do with the data, at the time they submit a grant proposal. Uh, and a number of the research councils have gone in that direction, as have research funders outside the UK and the US uh, and, and elsewhere. Other research councils are putting the onus on institutions instead. EPSRC in particular has issued requirements for institutions to have a roadmap on how it's going to re support researchers to basically do the right things uh, uh, about data. And it wants to see compliance and implementation of all that. That basically means services of one sort within the institution by 1st of May 2015. This is, um, that's got the attention of institutions in a way that those requirements on individual researchers have not done. And it's interesting, this is in a sense creating pressure from both directions, which is, uh, some see as helpful and some just see as annoying, perhaps. Uh, but uh, I'd, I'd, I'd personally go, to go towards the, the, the helpful uh, end of it. So these are, again, a summary of the sort of requirements that EPSRC uh, has. They want to see data access statements at the institutional level, policies and processes around how data is being managed, a recognition that not all of it is going to be kept, for instance, but they want some clear idea about how you make decisions about what to, to, to retain and what to, to throw away. They want permanent identifiers for the data to retain and, and securely preserving it for at least 10 years after its last use. That last one in particular has worried a lot of institutions. Some people have said, that means I might have to keep data for 100 years. You know, and that's a real worry. Uh, and my feeling is, well, actually, I think if you've got data that people are still using in a scholarly context 100 years after you created it, you should be breaking out the champagne. You know, that, that's scholarly impact of the sort that very few, few of us uh, achieve. And the costs of doing that really will be trivial compared to the impact you're getting from it. But nonetheless, many researchers do feel concerned about this uh, drive towards openness and data in general, and, and, and there are a variety of excuses that some people have characterised them, or, or, or concerns, I think, if, if one is um, going to be more generous to, to what are often, I think, real concerns on the part of, of researchers. Uh, and some people, for instance, uh, a reference down there to a blog from the California Digital Library at Carly Strasher, has attempted to deal with many of the commonly expressed concerns and, and give responses to them, some of which uh, are, are quite blunt, uh, and some of which I think are, are, are somewhat more open. So uh, a common question is, you know, if, if I make da my data open, it's just going to create problems for me, because then I'll get all sorts of questions about it, and it will divert me from the research I'm doing now, because I, I have to keep dealing with questions about the research I did in the past. Well, that's one of the reasons why we, we many disciplines have data centres, and, and the idea of those is to make data independently reusable, reusable without having to go back to the creators, and that is one way to avoid that problem of people asking you questions about it if you really don't want to deal with that. And that, that it's a valid uh, concern not want to have to, to do that. Um, what I have less sympathy with, I, do, I used to run a, a, a data archive on behalf of the National Archives in, in, in the UK, which was uh, archiving government data. We got this same second concern there, people will only misinterpret it. Um, well, that's a general concern in public records in general. You know, we don't want to release the cabinet minutes. People will only read them and read all sorts of things into them that we really didn't mean at, at, at the time. And, and unfortunately, I think, you know, that's just, it's one of those things uh, in public life. Um, we put books into libraries that people are reading and misinterpreting all the time. But we don't think that's a reason not to have libraries. And, and the same should be true of, of research in general. And actually, that openness, in some ways, I think... Uh, mitigates against the sort of willful misinterpretation that you might get from, say, climate change deniers. Having material in the open strengthens, I think, the, the, the more common view. I'm not going to, given time, I'm not going to go through all those uh, I excuses, but we'll recognise there are some, I think, that, that the institution can help with, that the ones around permission, for instance. Real concern sometimes about, I'm actually not quite sure who owns this data. Very common in collaborative projects, Ones that be done in international context. And clearly, if you don't own something, you can't then give up the rights uh, or, or grant the license, which is what making something open is about. It's actually the granting of a permissive license for which you need to own rights in the first place. And, and there is guidance available on that, and I'll touch on that uh, a, a bit later. 
But the last one, again, a, a common thing, you know, that it's a bit of work to make this stuff open, and it's really not my priority. Uh, well, as I've tried to indicate before, the funders are making it your priority, and if you don't deal with that sooner or later, there are going to be implications for you as researchers uh, and for your institution as well uh, in terms of its research income. But clearly, that although there's a, a presumption in favour of making materials available, I don't think anyone is suggesting that that means that all data that's a product of research should be open access in the same way uh, that we might say about the, the journal articles themselves. There are all sorts of good reasons why particular data sets can't simply be made available to anyone to download. Uh, if, if any of us are part of a clinical trial, for instance, we wouldn't want data about ourselves that would identify us or could potentially identify us because it contains too many bits of information that are quite specific to us, even if our name uh, isn't there. We wouldn't want that uh, to be open to, to anyone. And indeed, many of the reasons for not making data open are to do with data protection. Other reasons we dealt with, for instance, with that um, government data I dealt with before, related to sites of spe special scientific interest. It contained often very, very precise information about the location of extremely rare plants and animals. And in some cases, revealing that would almost guarantee that the site would be destroyed. So there's a way they're revealing almost everything, wh whilst perhaps fiddling around somewhat with the information about location, so that you're not providing a precise uh, location, but enough that somebody can do something interesting with that data, uh, because much of the rest of it is, is, is of interest. But to say that the data itself should not be open is not the same as to say that its existence should not be public knowledge. And that's a key difference really we want to stress. There is no reason that we can think of why you shouldn't admit that a particular data set exists and say something about what's in it. That should be publicly discoverable in the same way that we have metadata records and repositories that tell us that a publication exists even if we don't have the, the text of it. And it's back to the idea that, that if we have that, the information about the data set, if it doesn't link to the data itself, can link to whatever process you have to go through to establish your right to use it. So the data from clinical trials, for instance, is usually made available to bona fide researchers who can demonstrate that they'll keep the information confidential and only use it in accordance uh, with the ethical permissions that, that, that were gained at the time that data was, was acquired. But if you didn't know the data was exist, existed in the first place, you might end up repeating that same trial. Human suffering is involved in doing that, a risk to individuals. And simply knowing that somebody else has done the work and being able to have a conversation with them about, can we use this, what do we need to, to, to prove to use it, is, is what we want to be able to do, avoiding that replication. So going back to, to that issue about what universities are often you know, concerned about having to store all this stuff and comply with all those, those, those demands, there are many universities and many researchers who believe, oh, well, you know, the answer to this is subject to specific data centres, and we have lots of them. Uh, we at the DCC attempted... Uh, to, to compile a list uh, some time back. We stopped somewhere around the 700 mark, and others uh, are now continuing that, that, that work uh, on a funded basis. DataBib in the US, a project called Re3Data uh, in, in the European Union. The problem with this is even though there are hundreds, if not thousands, of these things about, these are just a few examples uh, of them in the UK, there are lots and lots of research disciplines that have no data centre to serve them. And it's not easy to make these things just appear. I think there has to be a sort of willingness within the, 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 the research community to create them as well as the backing from the funders. And although it's right that where you've got a working data centre that's doing the right job, the data ought to end up there. Somebody else shouldn't be trying hard to it. We've still got to deal with the fact that, that lots of data is going to be lost if data centres are, are the only place for it to go to. But we also need to recognise that some of them really need to, to change their behaviour uh, in some way. Some of them are I would say club-like uh, in, in, in many ways. Um, they, they have barriers to access uh, of many sorts. Uh, in some cases, they'll only provide data to people who contribute uh, to them, and, and, and they can be highly territorial. Uh, that is changing. I mean, one can look at examples in the UK, the UK Data Archive, which 20 years ago had some of these characteristics. I tried and failed at one point to prove my bona fides as being somebody who could get data there, but the UK Data Archive has completely changed its behaviour uh, and, and now provides uh, clearly open access to much of the data that can be made, made available in that way and makes it very straightforward to discover all the other data that it has where you do need to sign 
uh, agreements of some sort about the confidential information uh, that's there. Data centers like that, you know, they've got some value. They are protecting information. They are making it available to a closed group of scholars, but we need to open that up a lot more, particularly uh, when we're interested in, in cross-disciplinary research. But it's worth bearing in mind that the funders aren't saying these things just because they like uh, to, to be awkward. They may well like uh, doing that. I wouldn't want to make any assertions, but, but this is not the reason uh, why, why they're, they're, they're doing these things. It is about value, value to the funder, value to society, value to the researchers involved and to the institution. And I'll try in the next few minutes to prove uh, that, that each of those assertions has something uh, behind it. Certainly, uh, Biz accepted that when uh, it, it agreed to funding through, through a funding program through GISC uh, in the DCC and other elements uh, of GISC, which showed that in some investment of around 1.5 million a year in creating national infrastructure uh, to do, make research data discoverable, uh, preservable, uh, and everything else is going to pay back 2.5 times its value after we were doing that for five years and continue uh, to do that uh, thereafter. Uh, a recent study about the British Atm Atmospheric Data Centre, one of a series that's been carried out into looking at the economic value of data, cen data centres, shows returns of somewhere between 400 and 1,200%, depending how you value uh, certain things. But they're fairly confident intervals on the, the money that goes into that. That's because new research can be done more quickly, uh, it, it, it can be done uh, at, at lower cost. There are all sorts of different ways in which that value is generated, in which it's not just uh, about individuals saying, oh, I think that's really good. It's about us being able to, to, to put an economic value on it. But there are other reasons. Although I can recommend, for instance, the Journal of Irre Irreproducible Results as an entertaining read for almost anybody uh, who's involved in any sorts of research. Most of us don't aim to, to publish our work in, in, in journals of, of that type. Research is meant in some way to be reproducible, and it's connected very strongly with integrity, uh, things that institutions do worry about, research fraud. Almost all the cases of research fraud one can uh, identify are tied in some way to the fact that it was very difficult to get hold uh, of the data behind these things. And in some cases, again, there's human suffering, even death involved as a result of some of these cases uh, of, of uh, research fraud. Conversely, there's a good deal of evidence that when your research is, is reproducible, it is more likely to be cited. And that's something that everyone involved, every actor involved, the researchers, the funders, the institutions tend to value. I mean, these are just some examples. There are many, many examples I could give uh, around the non-availability of data being connected to fraud. Cyril Burt, um, Something that, that, that sticks in my mind, I was just starting at UCL where, where Bert had, had finished his, his academic career in 76, when the first serious questions are being raised about his twin studies. Well, as you aren't familiar with that, Bert was one of the people who, who did lots of the work on trying to determine if intelligence was genetic or to do with the environment. Uh, and he did this by you know, the simple method of taking some identical twins, you separate them at birth, and then you, you understand how different environments affect these things. Well, he didn't separate them, but he was working at a time where this sort of thing did tend to happen through, through adoption and different societal practices. It's not the sort of research that you tend to get ethical approval for if you were attempt to replicate it today. So his original data would have been very significant, and it is suggested now that he falsified almost all of it. We really can't determine anymore what was false and what was true, and therefore we just have to ignore almost everything he, he produced. Uh, the Duke case, there's a link uh, on the slides there to, to more information uh, about that involved clinical trials of a, uh, what was claimed to be a new cancer drug uh, with significantly lower side effects that eventually, after many, many years and persistence on the part of others who, who had endless barriers put in their way towards getting the original data, uh, was shown uh, to be fraudulent. Duke is now being sued for large amounts of money by some of the people involved and, in some cases, by their, by their families because the original people aren't around uh, to, to sue them anymore. Uh, and a number of cases in the Netherlands recently around uh, psychological areas, in some cases where there's clearly fictitious data, and in other cases we actually we can't tell anymore whether the data was actively fabricated or whether it was just incredibly negligent research uh, that, that led to bad data management. So that's integrity. It's quite a negative thing, really, but there's positive effects as well. Making your data available increases citations, and, and we have quite a lot of evidence of that from different academic disciplines. I'll just give three examples there 
Alto Pianta and Lyle did work in the social sciences and humanities, studying lots and lots of grants uh, in, in social science and humanities in the States uh, and relating whether or not they could find evidence that data was available uh, to the citation rate. Very, very positive effect there. Not such strong effects shown uh, with microarray data with, in the field of our ambitions work, 20% uh, in astronomy. These are pretty different fields. And although the effects vary, they are always positive. And, and there are other studies that replicate that sort of work as well. So another a positive incentive there to, to, to make your data available. But it's also important to make it findable. Uh, if you can't discover this stuff, you can't easily reuse it. And you often want to link that to, to, to the publication. Uh, institutional catalogues have a role in doing that. National data registries have a role in doing that. That's one of the reasons why GISP is working with the DCC to try and bring that national infrastructure into place to help uh, magnify the effect of what institutions can do on their own. And we're building there on evidence that this already works uh, in Australia. One of the things that I think we'll need to think hard about in the future is, is that it's one thing to say, well, I've discovered perhaps two different bits of data and I can bring them together and do something interesting with them that neither of those pieces of research could do on their own. And you can do that by quite manual processes. But there's lots of areas of research where we want to do this sort of thing. We want to bring hundreds or thousands of pieces of, uh, of data together and integrate them. Uh, and, and to do this with as little human intervention as possible. And I don't think in many areas we really yet have the, the infrastructure or the tool sets to enable us to do this. But there's lots of evidence that we really get value out of stuff if we can make that possible. So I mentioned the Digital Curation Centre, which are from, can help. That's just an indication we produce guidance. Uh, that, that uh, helps you through many of these things. One of those there, for instance, is about the issues of data licensing, how to use licenses to achieve particular effects that you want to achieve. It's not, um, it doesn't take a particular position on whether stuff should be open or not. It simply says, if this is the effect you want to achieve, this is how you use licensing to do it. And we also work in depth with individual institutions uh, to help them establish policies and set up services uh, and even make the case for doing uh, any of this. And again, anyone who wants to know more about this can speak to me uh, afterwards. If you want to help yourself as well, there's, there's lots of information available on others that is also freely reusable, training materials uh, from, from other institutions in the UK. Uh, so the, the White Rose Group uh, in Sheffield, Mantra produced by my colleagues at the University uh, of Edinburgh, really basic training in good data management practices, and material from the Netherlands uh, as well, which is aimed at those in, in, in library and IT and helping them to understand uh, research data practices. Because the sort of things that we really want to achieve here, I and mean, we're all familiar with these sort of ideas of research life cycles uh, of, of, of one sort or another, and the idea that you know, you, ideally you can link, you know, hopefully outputs in one area of research can feed into to another area of research. But if we can do better on making data available, it does mean that even when some part of one of those life cycles fails, you, you start a project and you collect lots of information, in the end you don't get the result you want and you don't feel you've got something publishable. But your data may well produce something publishable for somebody else. And if it's citable in its own right, you'll still get the credit for the work you've done, even if you didn't get the paper you wanted out of it. And that is something I think which we'd all like to uh, achieve. We'd like to see more stories uh, like this, some of which, the first of which I heard reported at an event uh, that, that Michael Job and, uh, and colleagues ran a while about the value of data data centers, bringing together a paleontologist, somebody who studies dinosaur bones, millions of years old, who managed to resolve a burning research question from him for data from archaeologists who are dealing with stuff that's only from the last 10,000 years uh, or so. Basically managed to disprove something he'd spent ages trying to do uh, experiments to recreate and in the end a few minutes of work with, with other people's data uh, saved that time. Or indeed uh, the problem we have with the Icelandic volcano uh, a, a while ago when Researchers who were using uh, radar to study ice patterns in clouds realized that what they had been treating as noise in their data that they threw away was actually telling them where the dust was from this volcano, information that lots of people were desperate to have to work out where it was going to be safe to fly and, and where not to fly. Uh, the information, oh, how many people here have heard of the Old Weather Project? A few, yeah. That, that, that's, I'll explain a little about it then. They're using the logs of 19th century ships to get information now uh, that's helping us produce long-term climate models, getting people crowdsourcing the idea of transcribing the six hourly records of, uh, of temperature and wind pattern, whatever, so, so we can get a, a good picture of what the climate was like 
uh, in the 19th century. Some of you may have heard the story of Jack Andraka, summarised in some ways as this 14-year-old boy who used Google and cured cancer, which is somewhat compressing the fact that what he really did was use Google to discover some open access papers and some open access data, which he used to produce a much improved uh, and faster and cheaper test for some types of cancer. And the open access data and the papers were crucial to him doing that, as well as the fact that he's clearly a very bright individual who's going to do some <laughs> other interesting things. And there are more and more and more stories like that. It's important to remember that our data, hopefully in many cases, can tell stories that we didn't even imagine, that our own publications don't talk about. It has a different uh, and complementary value to the papers we produce. And making it available and making its existence known is going to help everyone to, to realise that. So thanks for your attention. Happy to answer questions when I need that. Glad to be of service. Um, again, it's a comment really rather than a question, and that's you, you talked quite a bit at the beginning about the research councils and what we're doing in this place. I thought um, colleagues might be interested to know that um, in the area specifically of data, data sharing, open data, there's quite a lot happening now. I'd like to characterise this by saying that we had so much fun on open access publishing that we thought we'd tackle open data next. Yeah. But, but seriously, the, the, the various points you've, you've made are very, very pertinent to what we're doing. So thanks for that. It's very helpful. Well, I hope so. I mean, our, our aim, what we're funded by just to do is really to, to support people in both, not just in achieving the, 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 the targets you're setting them, but, but in doing the right thing for institutions. I, I hope I showed there, there are lots of reasons to do all this, even if the research councils are making no demand of us at all. There are good reasons to do this, good reasons as researchers uh, and as institutions. Uh, and, and your requirements, I just think, I think there should be a lot less controversy about this than there has been with some elements of open access publishing. I don't think there's the same tensions, perhaps, as yet. Uh, You know, we haven't got an existing commercial data publishing infrastructure to deal with, for instance. Thank you. 